like to thank you all for coming to our talk this afternoon for our show, Behind the Mask, The Art of Women Welders. We are honored to have our distinguished Cynthia Nadelman here as our moderator. Thank you, Cynthia. She has been a long time contributing editor and writer for Art News, as well as other prestigious art publications. She's also curated many important shows, and she's an accomplished poet. So you might recognize her name as we are sculptors. The name might sound familiar because she's written some extensive uh, pieces. It's at her grandfather, sculptor Ely Nadelman, whose work I'm sure you know, and he's world-renowned and quite uh, illustrious. But if you haven't heard of his work, you should look it up, because he's an amazing sculptor. So on our panel today, we have Re Rebecca Wells. We have Farah Saleti. We have Nasuki Terayuchi. We have uh, Marsha Pels, and Schulberger isn't here yet, so we might have somebody stand in. She doesn't make it. Myself as curator, Janet Rutkowski, and in the wings here, sitting next to us, will be our co-curator, Karen Kevin Dinn. So welcome, and uh, I'm asking everyone to please refrain on asking questions until after the talk, and then you're free to ask what you like. And so let's begin. Cynthia? Well, welcome, everyone. Um, first, I just wanted to say, Karen acknowledged this in one of her Instagram posts, but the Rosie the Riveters, the Rosies, as they're called, were, were honored just the other day by the Congress. They got they have Congressional Medals of Honor, and these women, some of them are 107 years old. And there was this great picture of them with their polka dot um, red and white kerchiefs. And anyway, so I thought she was kind of a, a bit of a role model. Yeah, they, I should say. One of them was 107. Um, <clears throat> so I was going to sort of talk, moving on from that, I was thinking of going to the little history thing, World War II, blah, 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 post-World War II, sculpture, and all. Um, I, instead of doing a narrative, I'm not so good on narratives, I have notes and I'll just sort of blurt. So um, I'm just going to mention some things. World War II, um, GI Bill, which I think many uh, uh, dissertations can be written on the impact of the GI Bill on um, post-war sculpture, including you know, abstract expressionism, people who might not have become artists, um, who, you know, who were able to go to school, college, after the war, and art was the thing they wanted to study. <laughs> so it was very important. Apropos of that, there's a show at the Gray Art Museum, which is, I sort of recommend it to everyone um, right now, which is it's moved from Washington Square Park to Washington, to uh, Cooper Square. It used to be the great art gallery. Anyway, there's some great pieces by Claire Falkenstein there, and um, she's really good welding linear and model for her. She's California based um, post war. Um, at the show that's there, I'm sorry, it was about post war artists, American artists in Paris from about 46 to 1960. So it's interesting. The other thing that I've been thinking, I'm, I'm a proponent of this, but there's been a lot of talk recently about ceramics and fab fiber work and things like that, which is nice. I think it's great. It's getting it's work that's often been associated with women, so it's <laughs> good that it's coming into its own as an art form. But where's metal being? <laughs> so it's great to see a, good, a nice selection and collection of metal artists. And I'm, I'm so, yeah, this is a great good immersion in that. In that. I try to bring up the humor, but there's the adage of the um, the talking dog, where it's not so much what the dog says, but that it says anything at all. And <laughs> um, I think you've proven that in your work that <laughs> that's not the case with women welders. Okay, so let's you know, let's find out what you actually have to say. You know, as like the dog. My idea is to address a couple of individual questions about each of your work and have you discuss that along with addressing. Um, some general things for all of you, which is your studio experiences. Um, what are your own particular situations with regard to studios? You know, how many, where do you go for different things? And is that where you do most of your metal work? And what part about being there is pleasurable? What not so much? And um, so how important is the, that process to, your, to the product? Yeah, okay. So, um, so maybe you could also speak a little bit about the curatorial. 
experience. So um, actually, this is my fourth show here at Culture Lab. We love this space. It's incredible. Um, very supportive of the arts in all forms, um, as far as music, performance, art, comedy. So they encompass everything. They're not for profit, and they really support us as artists. So we actually, myself and my co-curator Karen Kettering Limit just uh, had a show here last year for a group we belong to called the Sculptors Guild, and that was Past Tense, Future, Infinitive. And it was quite a lovely show, but it seems like it did not have the impact of this show. We had no idea what we had gotten into. So we proposed the show and they accepted it, and we put out a um, open call, and we didn't get much response in the beginning, and I know there's lots of women welders out there. So I started to call people who I knew, and um, <coughs> then we, they, it started to trickle in, and we found the most incredible women. And we had to really be selective. We kind of had a vision. I wanted very powerful work, because I work really big and strong. Um, and then, Karen and also Tess Hausman, she's uh, the creative director, saw things in other people's work. So we really got a very, very diverse group of women. So this show has taken off so amazingly. People have no idea, we, and we've all heard this. You well? Uh, yeah, it's not brain surgery. Um, and we clean up really good. And it's some, it's just, a, a wonderful um, meeting. So I can't believe that people are in such shock when we do this. Um, as far as my studio set, I think that was one of the, I've had studios here in the city, on and off, it becomes a little difficult when you're welding because of equipment and space and oxyacetylene and things that that people think are going to blow up, which are worse than the kitchen. It really would take a lot for you to do something to blow up your studio. It would have to be pretty strange. I don't know. Never, I've never had a problem with any of my equipment. But my studio now is two hours northwest uh, in Sullivan County. I have a huge space. It's, it was an old horse barn with concrete floors. So I have a wonderful working space. I'm really, really fortunate. And I have invited some of my friends here to come up and weld with me whenever they want. How do you plot out you know, some of your individual pieces? I mean, I see that you know, the scale is sometimes very large, sometimes very small, but I don't know if those are maquettes for large, or do you well, start Well, actually, the two pieces that are here uh, on display, yes, or they kind of came from that. Normally, I work intuitively. I have a lot of scrap metal. I used to do architectural metals and furniture, so I have tons of scrap, too, too much scrap. And I just go in the studio and weld, and it just happens. This piece, we, we were doing a show for the Sculptors Guild at, um, in Greenwich, Connecticut at an art space, and they chose a sketch instead of an existing piece. So I had to build that in a month. So that was fun, but it's an incredible piece. And for instance, do you have some pieces that are, I mean, when you put something that's Look like it's been rusted. Is that a piece you had around? Yes, already? most of the time people bring me okay. um, scrap metal, you know, it's yeah. very inspired. Okay. I'm intrigued by the, um, Sheila, by, by the, um, the balancing that's going on in your these large metal pieces, which I think start out as sheet metal, like I suppose. <laughs> and I did see photographs of these little of small pieces that you've done, either from natural materials, from tiny twigs and vines, is what it looks like to me. We don't have to sort of labor, but um, it's interesting that they all deal with this balancing something on a fulcrum or on a pin where I, somehow, I don't know how you manage to, you know, well, how, what does it take to do that? Well, I, I think it's easier to describe it as, is a convex and a concave. So okay. you have something that is dug out and then something that is poking in. Yeah. And, uh, but it can also be reversed. It just mm -hmm. needs, so you can have, you can have it this way with the pin going in this way, or you can have it that way. Right. And uh, as long as the balance is perfect, right. What's on it'll, side. Just, it'll stay. Yeah. But also, if you don't
don't have that, it's just a matter of finding the center balance. And you can balance anything off of the side of the glass. You can just take a stick if you find that center. Of yeah. course, if you blow it, it's going to fall over. Right. But if it's just, right. you see it a lot in nature, too. Yeah, well, that's balance awesome. Balance the rocks or balance. Yeah. More weight. Right. Well, the winds are heavier here. I mean, in nature, they tend to sort of fall off. They do. It's like, yeah. But in but the areas, it's, they're, they keep. So far. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Great. Do you do most of this work in your own, in a studio of your own? You know, well, I will two days a week over at the art students leave in the okay. afternoon. Uh -huh. And then I also have a studio. Right. And uh, I was, I was, when you asked what our, the practice or how we feel about our studio space, mm -hmm. and I noticed that uh, when you work in a studio, an artist is uh, isolated in their studio. Mm -hmm. So it's total isolation. You're always quiet, you know, never around people. And, uh, at the league, I'm at least with people, so right. it's good to get come out of that isolation and and be a little bit more social. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Otherwise, you become you become like a I don't know, like a poet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now I mean, we'll jump to Marcia. And I didn't know where to start with you, because we go back to the 1880s. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, the 1980s. 1880s. Yes. <laughs> Well, because you actually sort of taught me a little bit about the kind of, I, I was, so I worked and started writing on it, you can tell me, you did some things together. It was more important, I think, in those days, a dichotomy of the kind of Anthony Caro collaging metal where you put one thing onto another, and it was a rejection of casting bronze and having one complete piece and that sort of thing, and you sort of broke the mold, as it were, because <laughs> you used mold. We could talk about more recent works, but the ones I really worked memorable from before where you do things like you cast broccoli stalks and milk cartons and things to make trees or buildings or whatever and then you weld it so you kind of did all of it and it wasn't looked on that you know it was kind of breaking breaking to it was done at the time here that, that your piece in the show is largely wood but it's got it's, it's a combination of things but it's obviously it's found things but it's clearly not wasn't found that way. <laughs> it's like guillotine, rack, chastity belt, um, stocks, and so on. So made from a lot of different things. But it's obviously work went into it, actually. You did do so. So we'll tell us about it. Would you forgive me? I don't mind talking about that piece, but if you don't mind, because I'm sure we all have stories like this, I want to talk a little bit about how I learned to weld. Because I think it's really important from a feminist perspective to tell this little story. I'm a painter at RISD, and they have a winter session, and you're allowed to take something outside of your major. So I go down to the foundry metal shop, and I want well for eight weeks. Well, it wasn't just chauvinism. I was treated with such disdain and disgust and humiliation that I went back upstairs with my tail between my legs, 1970. I didn't weld. Um, I always wanted to weld since I was six. I have no idea why. I think it had to do with drawing, because for me, welding was drawing in space. Anyway, next year, same thing happens. Now it's 1971. I go back then. I'm treated. I said, oh, it's a different crew. Maybe I won't be treated that way. Same thing happens. So now I've become a sculptor. I'm accepted to Syracuse. Now we're flashing to 1972. I still don't know how to weld. I'm a sculptor now, going for an MFA. I want to know how to weld. So I go to my professor, and I said, Craig, would you really teach me how to weld? He took one look, he one beat, he stopped me. He said, are you kidding, Marsha? You burn your tits right away. That's a joke. 1972. So what did I do? technical high school in downtown Syracuse. Um, you don't want to be in downtown Syracuse even now, much less in 1972. And they were having a course for a Hobart welding certificate. Um, so I went down there and for two months, four days a week, five hours a night, I took this course and there were 12 men there. 11 men in the course and of course a male professor. They were so great to me, I'm going to cry. 
they were so good to me. They were so thrilled to have a woman there. They were amazed. Ah. I learned so much from them. They were mostly garage mechanics who were trying to um, get their skills better, or Native Americans from the surrounding upstate tribes who wanted to weld the Alaskan pipeline and had to get a uh, Hobart certificate to do it. That's how I learned about I did not well learn in art school. I learned in a technical trade school how to weld. And since then, for 40 years, I've been teaching decades of American women how to weld. And it is still my favorite thing to teach because it's so immediate, it's so fabulous. You know, you're both in your helmet, you don't see each other, but you know, as soon as that person strikes that arc, the light bulb goes off. The light, the flash goes off in that helmet, and the light bulb goes off in that mind that this is so cool, I can put things together so quickly. It's not that hard. I don't have to be 200 pounds and strong. You know? It's just like sewing, I always say, because it really is. It's the greatest thing to do. So to backtrack, I'll be quick to answer Cynthia's question. Um, because I came from welding, I'm a collagist, I'm additive, I put things together. So it's very easy for me to put anything together now. Uh, right after that, I immediately became a bronze caster, and I'm known for casting. I mostly weld cast metals, but that first 10 years of my life, um, of my career, I made large scale steel outdoor sculpture. And because of that experience, it really influenced my practice and the ability that I have the confidence that no matter what the hell it is, I can put it together because I learned to well in the next 20 years. So this, this piece, uh, there are a lot of terrible things going on in the world. Uh, January 6th, I'm not going to talk about Trump. They discovered the Guantanamo Bay photographs. And I was mostly obsessed by the image of the hanging gallows that they built for Mike Pence that was on the cover. So I began to investigate um, gallows lynchings, which took me down the rabbit hole of torture, which took me down the rabbit hole of medieval torture. I mean, they were doing water border, water, water boarding in the 1200s. And there's this one thing uh, that particularly struck me. It's called a gibbet. I don't know of any of you basically a lynching hanging device, except the person is um, bound in a cage, open with rings somehow. So they're just left there to hang, usually upside down, and blood, you know, they just die and the animals come pick at them. Um, there is an incredible museum in Amsterdam, the Museum of Torture, which I recommend you all go to. Ha ha ha, on my own things in Amsterdam. And everything, everything about torture is made out of metal. Everything, everything is made out of metal. So that's what this piece is really about. There are two found objects in it that I had hanging around the loft for like, I don't know, a year, which happens a lot. I didn't know how I was going to put them together, but I knew I was going to put them together. I think the top is a printing press from the 1800s, and I think the bottom is a meat grinder from a farm a long time ago. And somehow I needed to bridge the gap between these two things that were old, but that looked like contemporary torture devices. So, so I made a given, and then I put a chastity belt on it. Too. So we'll know where to go when we need Okay, so at this point, welding is just, it's a thing you can just, you can, you use it's it for whatever. Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right, good. So, Farah, July, can, can you reach? I have to know your work from here, but um, so you're, you're, you're also mixing bronze and steel in these pieces, um, and you know, volumetric is a 
bimetal pieces you're calling them. Um, can you talk about the relationship of those materials for you? Um, and um, that's going to be one question. And then how does it, I, you have a, an architectural fabrication practice also, whether that relates, interrelates with, with your sculpture and how does it do that? <laughs> but, sort of give you yes. too many questions. <laughs> yeah. I'm a full-time metal fabricator and I run a custom architectural metal shop and uh, to talk about studios, I actually had a studio for 16 years and just last year I, I had to, uh, thank you, um, to move my shop and it, it was, it was life-changing and very scary because, um, I don't know, metal is everything, it's given me my a built, I mean, it's all I've done as an adult, full time, and um, I, uh, it's my passion, and it's this obsession that you, have, you know, like I needed to learn how to weld, and I wasn't going to do anything else but that, and the last 25 years have been doing nothing else really but that, and um, that's kind of led me to, I think I make my sculptures as a fabricator, I think of things uh, as uh, I make things in series, and I, I never work just on really one piece at a time. Um, I actually call these forms 19 by 29. They're each made out of the same size piece of metal, and I get six out of a sheet. And and it's just, I think for me, it was it's um, the more I limit myself uh, because I feel like there are so many materials, and there are so many things you can do, and the more I limit myself the easier it is for me to express myself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, there seems to be, they do seem very interrelated, the pieces in that. It yeah, seems like so it could easily be one piece. Right? Is there anything you're basing that on? Is it like a negative space of a box or anything? I've seen that kind of thing done I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so, very attracted to architecture, mm -hmm. to cigarettes yeah. and old pyramids, to arches. Um, for me, they're really simple abstractions of architectural forms. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I was kind of very, like, attracted to Greek temples and Greek architecture because growing up in D.C., so I think that they relate to architecture to me. It's also important that they can be seen in many different, um, they don't have a directionality. Uh-huh. All right. Okay. Look at your room. Oh. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I'm, not, I'm welding this deal with bronze rod. and. Um, my feeling was like I like to weld, I like my helmet down, and I like to be alone. And what these sculptures give to me is um, is that time alone, just welding in a line because there's something that's really magical and beautiful when you strike the arc and it's like it's obsessive. And all like I don't have very good vision because I've been welding for so long, but you know, like I probably need like maybe 150 reading glasses. I wear 250 when I'm welding because I'm obsessed with seeing the line and not just the shadow of the line, but the actual line itself. Um, so I think the work is uh, therapeutic for me. You know what I mean? Like it's what I get my time alone, and it's uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting, actually, getting a sense of what the welding is not just a need, I mean, a, a tool, but really this, this sort of thing people are passionate about, which is it's great. <laughs> which kind of goes right into, Rebecca, um, your pieces, you're the sort of, you're the representative of linear work in this show. We're all talking, I mean, there's heat involved with all of this for all of you, and I'm kind of be interested to know how that affects everything that you do, but and you need it to, to bend the wire, to, and the, your filaments, I'm not sure if that's what you know, wire is the right term. First you need it for that, and then, um, um, which you've described as, you know, you like to do it spontaneously, kind of, it's like drawing, it's obviously drawing in space. Um, and then, then there's the welding that welds certain pieces together, I should say. Um, yeah, how, uh, so how does spontaneity come, come into the whole thing? And, um, and I also want to say, how many hands do you need to do this? <laughs> backtrack a little bit, um, there are uh, a lot of us here, uh, a lot of uh, the artists here are doing um, electric welding, so they're striking an arc and it's a different kind of a thing, whereas there, there are a few of us that are doing um, oxy 
acetylene welding, which is with you know the oxygen tank and the acetylene tank, and it's a, it's a different kind of a torch, um, and it's a different kind of a process. Um, I'm not sure that it gets too hot when you're doing art welding. Is that right? Um, I mean, it's hot. I, I, it's hot. It gets hot. It's hot. <laughs> I haven't done it in so long, but um, the the um, oxyacetylene gets pretty hot. Um, sometimes I I will have on um, the mask and I wear the kerchief, and if it's a hot day, I'll, things will just start sliding down. <laughs> so then I realize I have to take it all off and like, you know, take a little walk and cool off. Um, it's very meditative, and I love the, it is an, an intuitive process for me to, um, you know, I'm actually bending it as I'm connecting it, and it, I, my idea is that it, it looked like it has no beginning and no end. Um, also, I'm working with a hard material, but I want it to look really soft. I want it to look like it's breathing and moving and, and growing and changing. And uh, uh, a lot of my inspiration, is certainly with um, this work here, has to do with things underwater. Um, I've done, I've had the privilege of being able to snorkel and scuba dive, and um, it's just been so. Uh, Fascinating to see things underwater and see how they're moving and growing. Um, I've also been teaching biomimicry, um, which is another um, inspiration of looking at you know how nature is solving um, you know, how nature is solving problems. I mean, nature's been around for uh, almost four billion years, whereas humans are you know three hundred thousand. Um, so it's just really inspiring to look at what you know how nature is, is solving these problems and the things that nature can do. So uh, that's sort of always in the back of my, my mind as to, uh, even though I, I'm not like directly uh, imitating, it's always sort of in the back of my mind. Um, and uh, what else did you ask? <laughs> um, the, the studio? Uh, yeah, well I, I guess it sounds like you're able, on the scale that you work on, you're, you're able to do it in, in your own studio and you have I am. I had a studio actually within walking distance of this place for a long time, for actually 10 years. Um, it got um, sort of priced out of that. So I have a new studio in Jersey City, which is, the space itself is really kind of sublime. It's, um, I have 14 foot ceilings and I'm looking out at the New York Harbor and watching the, the ships come in. And I, I must say I get, I'm getting a little distracted by the ships because I, I'm starting to read about shipping, so it's already starting to come into my work because I'm starting to work with some elements that are sliding in and out, like, like in currents or, or paths. Um, so it's really pretty interesting. I, I love working by myself. I, I think I would find it kind of uh, annoying if someone was working next to me. It's just, it's so meditative. I make a lot of noise, and I don't think anyone would want to be with me. So. Um, it's just really, I, I love being able to make a noise and make noise and make a mess and just be very meditative about what I'm doing. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. And then the, um, for all of you, I guess, the, the relationship between, because hammering was discussed earlier, but the, and I guess a lot of that goes on with certain ones in your work. Um, sort of the relationship between, that's a whole different kind of action, it seems like. I, I gather, and you teach welding also at the yes, Stratus. Yes, that's right. where I study welding and art. I came from Japan 15 years ago. Not knowing anything about art or sculpture, no idea. And I had actually no interest in metal sculpture or welding. So I started from well, uh, painting and drawing, mixed media, and then I realized that I need to learn welding in order to support my painting or to make a flame for my paintings. So I had my classmates who really encouraged me, like, you should do welding, because there's always community and classmates, you know, encouraged to do something. Okay, I'll try, and that's how I, I start learning welding at the Children's League, and honestly, like, I did not like at the beginning, because I'm a little allergic to metal, so I get skin rushes, I don't like noises, and I think a lot of women get intimidated at the beginning of practice because it's very intense. So it's normal that people get 
scared and nervous. So when I'm teaching there, I said, it's okay. It's okay to be nervous. And you will get used to it. And then a lot of people fall in love. You know, like some people fall in love first day. Some people gradually fall in love. And in my case, it was gradual. And then I couldn't see myself as a metal sculptor until maybe, you know, a few months passed. You know, then I start making small sculptures, and then I realized I'm a three-dimensional artist. I'm not a painter. This is what I, you know, I can work with. It just naturally forms came out for me, and so it's like um, maybe I'm unusual that I didn't come to class because I want to make a metal sculpture. It wasn't my case. Uh, so, but I ended up. creating my work and developing my work in the metal sculpture. And then I, I was lucky enough to start teaching there. By teaching there, of course I was a master then in you know, teaching, uh, I learned a lot through working with other artists' projects and you know doing metal fabrication work, which I start doing at the same time. Uh, working with other people, learning new techniques and all those things uh, really helped me, you know, build my strengths. Then I did a couple of really large scale sculpture for public art. And then I was in a metal shop in Guam, with this lot of metal guy in a metal shop and they're, you know, doing stuff and I feel like, you know, I can't really be part of that. They're like, get out of our way. So it wasn't really good experience, but I knew that it's the sort of truth that women just going to the metal shop, then you know they wouldn't expect you to walk just like a man. So, so I was like, I started actually like weightlifting. <laughs> I did actually. It's like I, I didn't want them to think like, oh, you can't even carry that piece of metal. So I wanted to be strong. I wanted to be good, and I wanted to be able to do everything they can do. So I was like pushing myself, pushing myself like over years by doing, you know, different projects. But if I think of how I started, you said like, um, you know, I do also my um, oxycellin molding. Mostly if my work is done by that. I use teak and ring and everything, and I do a lot of mixed media work. Because I, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, yeah. The, gla the use of glass and threads and, I, and yeah. small glass is pods. new, yeah. Glass is new. But I do uh, textile, paper, you know, uh, wax, a lot of things. Even if I do make 100% metal work, I mix different metal, like bronze, steel, brass, stainless. Um, I, I, I think like I really like to mix different technique and medium. So um, it, it really helped me learn how to build the sense of like process of fabrication, like okay, what I need to do, uh, you know, from process from point A to Z, I need to know the process before I finish. Like I have to visualize the, the piece and kind of have a plan. I think that's kind of different from like for example painting or you know other types of work. Um, and also by working with other artists, I. Uh, I consult other artists, uh, publication, and so that really gave me a lot of ability to think of my work too. Like, how can I make this idea happen? Like, what kind of medium do I have to use? And it's not necessarily always metal, but it definitely gave me a lot of uh, insights by doing that work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Any questions leading to anybody's mind that they want to, to, to respond to? Or should yeah. I open it to the audience? Oh, we could open it to the audience. Hi. Well, the show's called Women Who Weld. Marsha told a story that would apply to women in many, many professions. I mean, medicine, law, even accounting. I had a friend who, who worked for Arthur Anderson who said, well, you'll never be able to carry those accounting bags. You know, those big bags you do when you do an audit. So, have all of you had the same experience? 
as Marsha, albeit mutatus mutandus? So maybe I started a little bit later than other people. Um, I actually went to the High School of Art and Design and really it was geared for commercial art, so it took me 10 years later to discover that I needed to work again. And I started with drawing at the new school and that wasn't uh, very exciting. So I actually did stone carving, wood carving, clay, until I was blowing up everything in the kiln and a very wonderful teacher told me, uh, you need to learn how to weld. And I was fortunate enough at that time, the Sculpture Center, which is now here in Long Island City, had a wonderful facility on 69th between Lex and 3rd. So they had a wonderful gallery and they taught stone, wood, clay, and welding. So I started a welding class, but I really didn't take that many classes. It was instant. The minute I turned on that acetylene, the, the, you know, the MIG weld ramp, it was instant love. And I, I feel I'm pretty much self-taught and I've done architectural metals and furniture. And I've worked in shops with men where I needed them to build larger things for me. I never had a problem. They were always so amazed that to see me with a plasma cutter, like cutting like shapes freehand or welding, they were always really supportive. And I, for me, it was always a wonderful experience. And this is 35, maybe 37 years later. And I love it, and I think that Teachers are so important. You should, you know, show other women. I taught a young student of mine who is a martial arts student. I taught her how to weld. I brought her up to my studio. She's 17 years old, and uh, I, so I think this is a legacy that we need to promote. Anyone else? Because I, I didn't say much about teaching as a woman artist, uh, so a lot of uh, students sign up for the class at the Artisans League of Women. As you know, like a modern part of women. Um, and they're so passionate and dedicated. And then, uh, so I, I will have like a lot of new women artists coming into class and interview. Oh, I never well it. Can I do it? I have no experience. And they're really nervous because they don't know anything about it. And I said, fine, it's normal. Nobody know how to do it at the beginning. And, um, you know, some people have a confidence, especially men with some experience. Like I did some meat work, I did some carpentry, so I know. But some women who have no experience with any tools, I will tell them, you know, there are certain things that maybe other male instructor will show you a certain way, but maybe it's not easy for you. I sometimes encounter that, that you know, male instructor says, okay, this is how you do it. And they don't realize how hard it is for women which makes sense, I don't blame them. So I only know because I experienced that as a student myself, that I try to do what they do, and it's hard. Like for example, hammer, or you know, bending like a heavy metal or pipe. So here's a trick, you know, you don't have to be super strong, you can do this, then you can do it. And okay, you wanna change the tongue, roaring tongue. Uh, they do it like nothing, but it's not easy for women. So here's a trick. So like I have those tricks that I learn as a woman mother. So I teach that, and I hope that's help. I think it's good to have a woman mother artist in the school, in the school, at least one, you know, among some. I'm obviously the oldest person here. I was born in 1880, <laughs> and I, I will say that obviously things have gotten better. That was. 70, so how many years ago was that? 53 years ago. So each decade gets better. And when I started to teach welding in 1980, which now is 40 years ago, it was one of my main uh, prerogatives to teach as many women to weld as I could. But of course, I also love men, and I taught men how to weld, and there wasn't any problem. But one thing I do want to say is everybody is bringing up 
I don't want to call them alternative spaces, but community organizations, or as much as I love the Sculpture Center, no one has really talked about academia. And I have a friend here in the back who knows as well as I do what academia was about. And academia was so fallow-centric, and the sculpture department was the worst of all of them. So I think that residue of um, chauvinism and academia is what I s suffered from. And I didn't suffer from it in, in trade school, but in academia, it was omnipotent. So that I hope that clarifies Whoops. my experience. You know, so it's not that they don't think we should be or surprised that somebody could, it's just they don't think of women when they think of a welder and or even a welding artist they're thinking of these big uh, i-beams and you know uh, massive kinds of things and so it's that shocked look that we all get you know i think even um, alexandra was you know some of her big uh, pieces you know and, and she's uh, you know statuesque but but uh, people have uh, assumed that men have made those pieces for her, for the displays in the, in the shops, the windows, right? And so, you know, she's, I mean, I, I over there actually is really a self-portrait. Um, you know, when she stands right by it, it's like, okay, this is a self-portrait, but people will assume a man made that for her. So that was the impetus of the show. It's not an overt um, uh, sexism, it's just uh, when they think of welding, that actually is a common thing. I also would add to that too, as I am Alexandra, I made these people in the show and <laughs> the figures. A lot of times people just say to me, I thought a man made it. Just I thought a man made it. I didn't think there was a woman involved at all. And one of the things I've always told people about making this work is I don't, when I'm making work, or when any artist makes work, I don't, I don't associate it with gender. I mean, it's just art. And I just feel like I'm a translator and something, some other force is moving through me when I'm working. I don't think of it as a gender-based act. So um, I, 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 when I had, um, after I learned to weld in, in college, and then afterwards I realized I didn't have the setup to do welding. So for I had a 25-year career working with sheet acrylic that I would sand and fold and bend and paint. And, um, and then I, I was having some health issues, and I had a, at that point had a barn upstate, so I started the cement floor so I had a friend that was a welder and she came over and we got the tanks and she said, so we, we hooked them up and, and, and then I went, I, went, I went ahead and started welding but my first show of the welded work someone came up to me and said well who does your welding mm -hmm. and um, it just seems like um, kind of a normal thing as, as has been said before that we're not expected to know things or know how to weld and I've been teaching in an industrial design department at um, Pratt for over 30 years, and um, um, I I know how to build a lot of things and how to make a lot of things, and I know a lot of technical things, not just welding. And people don't expect for me to know those things either. Unfortunately, I've been there so long that I think now they get they they realize, okay, she knows how to do this. She knows how to make a prototype or build something. And um, but I think it it takes a long time, and I think it, also as Marsha's said, it's gotten better. You know, it's definitely gotten better, so. Um, so just speaking of um, making a sculpture out of metal, not just focusing on welding, I was wondering how long it take you, like any of you, to become comfortable with the material and the techniques to fully express what you were imagining yourself to do with the material or in another scenario to be fully free to experience with the material and just um, create with it. And um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, um, because 
I can imagine that it cannot be instant because it's um, hard to control and it's hard to become intuitive to just work with the material. So that was my question. Well, I just wanted to say that for me, it was, I think it takes three months just to get used to the fact that you cannot hear, you can't see, and you can't feel, and you can't smell. You know, mask, a respirator for the gases, earplugs, so you don't hear the grinding and the welding machine and everything else. And uh, then once I found that my breakthrough was after three months that I walked into the welding studio and I felt naked if I didn't have everything on. So if you can get past getting used to the fact that you're not working with your senses anymore, then it becomes then it's just about putting in the hours, like everything else. I mean, I think uh, for me with doing balances, uh, well, I'm still working on it. Uh, I'm still working on it, but it, I would say I would say five years before I really felt like I understood how how to balance tigging. Uh, you have to put the hours in, so it's just uh, again I would say three years, but I'm now at, at ten years it feels like I can really, it really flows. And you think, it's like, I, I don't know, like playing the piano. How long does it take to play the piano well? You have to practice, you just have to keep doing it, and it's like any, any other material, so. Uh, anyone else? Uh, obviously, I had a very different experience, and um, I'm not saying, you know, I had no problem at all with any of it, but that was because my first jobs at a graduate school in industrial foundries and art foundries. And I welded for years in foundries, so I had no choice. If I didn't know what I was doing, and if I didn't do it fast, I wouldn't have had a job. So I went, guess what I'm saying again, is I really didn't learn anything in the sculpture department about welding. So what did I do as soon as I got to New York in 73? I worked in industrial foundries and art foundries, and that was it. So then when I took it to my own practice, it was smooth. I will say, though, that if, if, we each, if you each cross-examine each of us, there are so many different kinds of welding. The art, the oxycetylene, the tig, and the mig. And each one does take a different kind of perfection in terms of touch and coordination and everything. So that is something that might not come natural to someone who's an arc welder. You know, they might have to take a while to learn how to take. But if you're doing it for a living, you have no choice. I have a very similar experience. I, um, my first project was just welding the rods with oxygen welding, which is the <coughs> easiest. You don't have to even like stand up and go grind. You can just sit and weld, meditating for hours and hours, and you can finish a sculpture. And that's what I loved to do at the time because it was the easiest way. Then I got a job as a fabricator. So now I have to weld aluminum and make a base. And I have to weld stainless steel make sure everything is flat and angled, which is completely different kind of work that, than what I was doing. And not forgetting, it has to be accurate, I have to measure, you know, everything. So I, I learned so much from doing that. And that's not my work. That, that was useful for my work because I learned the technique, right? So more you do it, you learn your techniques, and that will go to your work. But sometimes I do have an idea, like, okay, this is what I want to make, and I don't know how to do it. That's when art school is really useful, because then you can ask your teacher, I have this idea, how can I make this? Then your teacher will say, oh, you have to learn teeth now. You only know oxy selling welding, but now you have to do how to form, how to teeth, so you will practice that. Then you become good at it, and then you want to learn more something else. So like, it's an endless journey of learning new teeth. Well, I, I'd like to, that's partly about the education and academia and stuff, I'd just like to sort of say that um, it's, it's nice to hear people talking about techniques and about actually doing things. I mean, for a long time in academia, 
kind of learning, teaching students how to actually do things was kind of not, not, not at the top of it. Thing. And um, so if you wanted to, there was a problem. Um, also, maybe it goes back to um, the, the whole thing about the, sort of the Second World War. The, the, the Rosies were sent home. The men got to go to college. And maybe they learned, well, then from some people who had begun, men and male artists who began to do it in the 30s or something. And uh, it was sort of macho, and it was abstract expressionist. And it was, although women were doing it, they're the ones we have to sort of find out about now. But it was certainly a challenge. Did you, I just wondered if, by, by being both a fabricator and a um, and an artist, did you want to address any of this sort of discussion? I, would, I was thinking. I was thinking when uh, I was listening to everybody else's stories. Uh, yeah, uh, I was I was a union welder um, right around 9/11, and I went into a big metal shop. I had already worked in metal shops, and there was probably a hundred people on the floor, and most of them were men. And I did find that, like, they want, everywhere you go, you can learn from anybody. And they don't have to be, you know, like, there is something that I can learn from every other fabricator and welder. There are tricks, people do things differently. I do things because of what I have in the shop. Other people have other tools. But I feel like I have learned from every shop I've been in. And, um, and that, you know, the one thing I have to say is working in big shops with a lot of men is that men talk more than women do. <laughs> and, and if there are two women in a shop, they will put you in competition with each other, always. And I always told them, I'm like, I'm not competing with her, I'm competing with every single one of you. You know, because I want to be the best and I want to be ranked the highest and uh, I just had very, you know, I, and I also feel like I'm never done learning with welding, you know, like TIG, MIG, fabrication and stuff. Now I'm really interested, you know, learning like great forming and other, but now it's like, now that I'm getting older, I'm thinking like, oh, I want to learn to be a machinist. Like, I'm never going to be done, you know, and, um, and I think that that's what's great about the, the metal itself as a material is that you can continuously learn started off as an abstract sculptor and then I was doing furniture. So furniture involved a lot more technique and thinking and I'm not really good with measurements as my husband will tell you. And I started to do architectural metals. I was doing railings and gates, big, big projects and I was out designing myself. And uh, I was fortunate enough to grab a, a, a wonderful man from a young man from a welding shop like an industrial shop and he would come up and help me and assist me and I'd say well I want this and he would know how to show me how to do it he would he was from Peru so he could like make a jig on the, on on my welding table he's like welding on my welding table don't weld my welding table and show me how to bend things and then I was lost him, but I actually found Farah. And <laughs> Farah used to come to my studio and help me make ironwork. Yes. She was my assistant. Yes. <laughs> and then she went off and made a lot more money than me, probably. But now, turn this around, I've never ticked well. And I've asked Farah to teach me how to tick well. So it's a never-ending process, and you just keep building on it. And the amount of time it takes you to do work is so subjective. It could take a day. It could t I could have things sitting on a shelf for years, and then all of a sudden I said, oh, now I know what to do with that. You just, you, you really, there's no time limit. There really isn't. It makes me want to learn welding. <laughs> I have teachers. Right. <laughs> the reasons I stopped welding is that I felt that I couldn't make the forms that I wanted to make, that I would have had to have become a metal smither. Did, has anyone ever worked on a forge? There's a number of them in the, in the shop. I mean, in the How shop. do you feel about forging versus welding? Because I feel it's very different. Um, forging is really exciting, but it, I, I know now I'm too old. Yeah. <laughs> it it's, it's just takes a lot of, you know, and, and you're supposed to do it from up here, but it's pretty exciting. 
Yeah, there's somebody here doing wonderful forged fruits and uh, the, the yeah. Family. Yeah, they were pretty, pretty yeah, amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marsha, did you do some forging on your piece? I did forging, and I'm now forging. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, the the Venus here uh, is by Marsha Powell. Um, yeah, I, I'm in love with forging, and I actually discovered that I've developed this incredible muscle. I just flew back from California on an exit seat, and the stewardess sort of looked at me with my gray hair and said, well, you know, can you do this? And I said, yeah, look at my muscle. But, um, <coughs> I mean, I actually started out doing jewelry, and I played with welding on and off, and lately I'm very involved in forging. I'm working on a piece now that um, is driving everybody at Art Students League crazy because I'm pounding, <laughs> and we'll be pounding 90 more things with that. Um, one important thing I would say to people that nobody told me starting out welding is, my glasses transition, they turn into sunglasses. And when you have a mask on, it instantly transitions, and then you have the glasses on, they stay dark. When I started welding, I mean, Sheila, I couldn't see anything. I mean, because, and nobody actually told me that. And I think somebody actually in bird watching said, oh, you can't see the colors of the birds because your glasses transition. And then I sort of made that connection. But um, forging is very different. I mean, every aspect of metal smithing, I've done um, metal smithing before, and jewelry, small scale sculptures. And somehow I love pounding, and I love that aspect of being able to transform the shape of the metal. So we're going to wrap it up, because we, um, we're really happy everyone came. If you have any more questions, we're here. Uh, please look at the show. We're here to answer any of your questions. We're really happy to have had this panel today. Very fortunate. I, these women, I have never done a show where every artist has put in so much love, attention, so enthusiastic. Karen and I had no idea what we were in for and what we had done. This show is also going on the road to be announced, so I hope you will sign up. I, I put out a book, so if you want to see where it's going next, you know, we'll, and it'll also be up on social media, but we're taking it into different venues. It'll be uh, behind the mask part two, and maybe three, four, and some other ones. So thank you, thank you for coming and supporting us. This is just a celebration of, you know, welding that we love. And I hope we imparted something on everyone else. Thank you. Thank you.